Questions without notice. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. Today marks the second anniversary of the Labor Prime Minister's solemn promise to the Australian order, people order. that there will be Sen no carbon Sen tax Sen under Betts. the government I lead. Sen Very touchy, Senator aren't Betts. They? Senator Betts, you are entitled to be heard in silence. I've on, on my right, Senator Abetz, like anyone in this place, is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Abetz, continue. Thank you, Mr President. Today marks the second anniversary of the Labor Prime Minister's solemn promise to the Australian people that there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. Does the minister agree that this broken promise is now easily the Prime Minister's best-known quotation? that it is seen by Australians as the defining statement of her Prime Ministership, that it constitutes Australia's most infamous political betrayal, and that her own personal and her government's legacy will be forever besmirched by the false statement she shamelessly made five days before the 2010 election. Order. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Mr uh, President, uh, Senator Betts is just full of rhetoric. Full of rhetoric. There is no substance to his question. There is no, issue, no interest in the big policy questions of the day. This is an opposition who have no relevance to anyone. No relevance to anyone. They have nothing to say about the big policy questions facing Australia, Mr President. And here they are. Here they are asking a question about the second anniversary. I thought they asserted that yesterday. It's a, it's a, it's a, they, they can't even get the date right, apparently, Mr. President. They can't even get the date right. Not only can't the Tactics Committee come up with a sensible question, but they, the best they can do is convince themselves. They all sat around and said, This is a brilliant question. This is a real killer. You know, everyone's going to love all that political rhetoric. Well, I don't know. I haven't met anyone on the street or anyone in, uh, I meet at the, at the footy or at my kids' sport who, who's interested in that nonsense. They're not interested in Sen that nonsense. Senator Evans, I could equally... Senator Evans, just resume your seat on both sides. Order. 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 The minister. Mr President, I could equally, equally uh, talk about it. It's uh, one year since the shadow finance minister uh, made clear that there was a $70 billion black hole in the Liberal Party's costings. One year, apparently it's the anniversary. Happy anniversary. But I suspect, I suspect those listening would say, what's that got to do with anything? Just like Senator Abetz's question. They want, to know, they want to know what's happening with the NDIS. They want to know what's happening with their cost of living. They want to know what's happening with their health. They want to know what's happening with the education services. The Commonwealth provides, Mr. President. They're not interested in act. Senator, we've heard a lot of arrogance from you guys in the last two days. Mr. President, the opposition will be better served focusing on policy, on how we meet the great challenges that Australia faces, rather than convincing themselves they sound brilliant with that really shallow rhetoric. Sen Senator Betts. I refer the minister to the words of Ms Gillard in 2005, and listen to this. The Labor Party is the party of truth-telling. When we go out into the electorate and make promises, do you know what we would do in government? We would keep them. Was Ms Gillard's promise that there will be no carbon tax an example of her truth-telling? Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Now, when there's silence, order, order, Senator Evans. Mr. President, uh, I'm sure it's a shame. I think Senator Betts didn't take my advice and continued to ask his pre-written supplementary question, which had been carefully crafted in Tactics Committee because they found a quote from 2005 and they thought, "This is the killer. This is the killer." We'll ask them about something that the Prime Minister said in 2005. It's not seven years ago. And somehow this is important to Australians. Somehow this is of vital interest to Australians. Mr. President, what we know is this parliament, this parliament has introduced a price on carbon that will set Australia up 
for dealing with the, with the threat of climate change and the need of our economy to adapt to that. Mr. President, we have acted, we have delivered good policy, and the Australian people and the Australian economy will reap the benefit of that for many years. And we know, we know that the Liberal Party will never, ever rescind that legislation. Saint Order, Saint Senator Betts. I can put the leader out of his misery. We will repeal the carbon tax if the Australian people give us a mandate to do so. But my supplementary question is, was the Prime Minister similarly engaged in truth-telling when she promised loyalty to Prime Minister Rudd, a citizens' assembly, cash for clunkers, offshore processing on East Timor and many other issues? This is an issue that goes to honesty and integrity of the government. Senator Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I was tempted to go to Godwin Gretsch, but I won't when we think about honesty and appropriate behaviour, because Senator Betts reminds me of his own behaviour. Reminds me of his own behaviour. And uh, Mr. Mr. President, I think the Australian people, as I said earlier, are more interested in focusing on the issues that confront them. We know, we know the Liberal Party once supported a price on carbon. They negotiated a deal with us. They ratted on that deal as a result of a party room coup that won by one vote. Well, Andrew Robb ratted on his leader. Mr. President, what we know is John Howard in 2007 said we needed to price carbon. What we also know is that is the right wing Luddites inside the Liberal Party des decided to reverse that sound public policy. Mr. President, the carbon price will serve Australia well, and we all know. The Liberal Party will never rescind that carbon price because it's good public policy. Time's expired. Before calling order, before calling Senator Marshall, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of a parliamentary delegation from Laos, led by Her Excellency Madam Pani, President of the Lao National Assembly. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate and, with the concurrence of honourable senators, I would ask the President to take a seat on the floor of the Senate. Yes. Senator Marshall. <laughs> well, Senator, thank you for that. My, Senator Marshall. Yes, Mr. President. My, my question is to the Minister for Tertiary Education, Skills, Science and Research, Senator Evans. And I ask, can the Minister advise the Senate on how the government's investment in Australia's higher education system has been reflected in the academic ranking of world universities. The Minister for Tertiary Education, Skills, Science and Research, Senator Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senator for his question. Mr. President, yesterday's release of the academic ranking of world universities was an outstanding demonstration of the quality and depth of the Australian university system. Australia now has the third highest number of universities in the top 100 worldwide. A fantastic result. It's remarkable when you consider that that's only behind uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, who have many, many more universities than Australia. A further 19 of us. Senator, you may not be interested in regional education, Senator Joyce, but this government is. That's why the numbers are up so much. That's why they're thriving. Mr. President, the National Party may not think education is important, but 19 of Australia's 37 public universities are now in the top 500. Mr. 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 President, it's a testament. It's a testament to the leadership, the staff, the students of those universities. But it's also a reflection of a government who's invested in those universities, invested in uh, their quality, invested in their research. Mr. President, we know under the Howard government they stripped funds out of universities. It's their favourite place they go when they're looking to fill their funding shortfalls, and we know they'll go there again if they get the chance. Mr. President, we've had record investment in universities, and it's paying off. We know that we've increased funding to university for research, including infrastructure, by 60 per cent. We also know, Senator Joyce, Se that there Se are more country kids Se going to university Se and Evans. more of them on youth Senator allowance. Evans, resume your seat. Senator Joyce, you'll cease interjection. Dear, oh dear. Senator Evans, continue. Senator, Senator Joyce. Have a look at the rural and regional figures. Why are they doing so well? Because we funded them properly. We funded them properly. And your disinterest in this issue does you no credit. 
Australia's future is as a smart country with a highly educated workforce, Mr. President. This result for the universities is a fantastic result and a credit to them and a great credit to Australia and this government's investment in higher education. Order. I remind senators that interjections are disorderly. Senator Marshall. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Can the minister. Order. Order. Senator Marshall. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I ask the minister, uh, can the minister advise the Senate on how the government's investment in Australia's higher education system has transformed access and participation? The minister. Mr. President, um, the ticket to uh, a strong future is a better future in education. By opening up the doors of university education, we are unlocking the potential of thousands more Australians who have been denied access in the past. Mr. President, one of the most pleasing things about yesterday's academic rankings is that the depth of the sector was revealed. It wasn't just about the, the elite, not just about the old, uh, uh, older universities in this country, not just about the sandstones, but about our newer universities and about our regional universities. Not only lifting participation, Sen but Senator but growing Evans, excellence. Senator Evans, resume your seat. Senator, Senators Conroy and Joyce, it is completely disorderly to exchange comments across this chamber during question time. I am seeking to listen to the answer of the minister. The minister, continue. Mr. President, as I say, one of the pleasing things is not only that we have been able to increase the number of Australians accessing university education and the numbers graduating, but we're actually also increasing the excellence of the sector at the same time. And Mr. President, there's been some commentators in recent days who've tried to say you can't do both. Well, I think these figures absolutely prove you can grow participation and lift excellence at the same time. Senator Marshall. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask, can the minister advise of any policy threats to these successes? Order. Order on both sides. Order. The Minister. Well, Mr. President, uh, I think the behaviour of Senator Joyce through this question uh, uh, period is showing exactly what the problem is. The opposition have no interest in higher education. Their record in government was to slash. High Senator Mason, you're excused. You are the exception. Which is why, why you did not gain favour under the former Prime Minister, because he was not interested in, e in either. Mr. President, a good university system is vital to this country's future. To, to grow that sector, to grow excellence, you have got to invest in it. The Labor Party is always committed to growing excellence and growing the, the, the strength of that sector. The results yesterday show that we are delivering on that, Mr. President, and those opposite are a great threat to that because we know where they will fund their black hole from. We know where they'll start looking for the $70 billion. They'll start in the university sector, where the Conservatives in Britain did and where they traditionally have. That is a real threat Time's to our expired. future. Time's expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing uh, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Uh, I refer the Minister to the 2012 edition of KPMG's Guide to International Business Location Costs, uh, the most thorough comparison of international business location costs ever undertaken by KPMG. Uh, is the Minister aware that study found that between 2010 and 2012 the cost of doing business in Australia went up by nearly 6 per cent, uh, while it came down in all other developed nations uh, studied except Japan? Is the minister also aware that the study found that the cost of doing business in Australia is now 3.7 per cent higher uh, than that in the US, while Canada and all European nations studied were as competitive or more competitive uh, than the US? Uh, why is the Gillard government pressing ahead with the world's biggest carbon tax when it will push up the cost of doing business in Australia even further and when independent objective analysis is showing that Australia is already losing its competitive edge against its international competitors. 
The uh, Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, first, uh, I think it's interesting uh, that Senator uh, Cormann, in his question, refers to Europe. Uh, as somewhere Australia should look to when it comes to competitiveness. Well, if Senator Cormann wants to have double-digit unemployment, if Senator Cormann wants to have the risks in the financial sector, if Senator Cormann wants to see economies contracting, well, certainly he can go out and explain to the Australian people that we should look to Europe. We should look to Europe. And he should explain to them. He should explain to them that while 27 million people around the world, as a consequence of the GFC, has lost, have lost their jobs, we have created 810,000 jobs here in Australia since Labor came to government. So, if he wants to talk about a track record, if he wants to talk about the strength of the economy, I suggest he needs to do better than to look to Europe. With all due respect to our European friends, the reality is that is not an example of an economy that is strong, and certainly, certainly not by comparison to Australia. In terms of investment in Australia, Did the question shows question? yet again, yet again, the sort of trash-talking of the Australian economy that is clearly not in the interests of Australian workers, but that those opposite are addicted to, that those opposite are utterly addicted to. They cannot bear the fact that since we came to govern, there has been $919 billion, $919 $19 billion invested here in Australia. They cannot bear the fact, they cannot bear the fact uh, that the economy is growing. They cannot bear the fact that unemployment is at 5.2 per cent. So they come in here, Mr. President. They come in here, Mr. President, and what they say is it's all really bad and it's going to get worse and it's really bad because there's this carbon price. And I know we said the sky would fall in previously and it might not have, but it's going to, it's going to, it's going to. Well, I think Australians deserve better than that. Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I refer the minister to the KPMG's analysis of electricity costs, which showed that Australia's power costs are already the highest of all 14 developed and developing nations studied, and that the cost of electricity in Australia per kilowatt hour is more than double that in the US, Canada, Germany, Great Britain and France, and higher even than that in Japan. Why is the Gillard government deliberately raising the cost of electricity by even more contributing to a further loss of international competitiveness and eventual loss of jobs, investment and prosperity? The, the the, the minister, the well, minister. Mr. President, I will do my best, but uh, a, I cannot see how that was supplementary. B, b, that was a speech, not a question. It was a statement, not a question. But I'm very happy to talk about electricity prices, which was the first part of that statement. Very happy, because as the as the senator should know, uh, the average electricity bill went up by about 50 per cent in the last four years without the carbon price. Without the carbon price, uh, and despite the fact, despite the fact. That Mr Rabbit claims that, uh, that this is a fabrication, the reality is that your own state Liberal ministers and even Mr Turnbull know that that's true. And I'll, re I'll, I'll just remind the Senate what Mr Turnbull said. There is no doubt that the bulk of the reason for the 50 per cent or thereabouts increase in electricity price, for example, in New South Wales in the last few years, has been because of investment in poles and wires. Unfortunately, he is one of the few that actually told the truth. Mr Turnbull. Maybe you should listen to him, Senator. Order. 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 Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Why is the government, and the minister in particular, trying to blame shift yet again when it has the direct power to bring power prices down now by getting rid of its carbon tax? Order. Order. The minister. Well, Mr. President, uh, it's, it's pretty desperate, isn't it, in the face of uh, the facts? In the face of the facts that the vast majority, the majority of the increase that we've seen in electricity prices, for which there has been no assistance, for which there has been no assistance, has been for reasons entirely unrelated to the introduction of a price on carbon. 
and Senator Cormann cannot even convince members of his own front bench, like Malcolm Turnbull, who had the temerity to tell the truth on this issue. The temerity to tell the truth on this issue. The temerity to actually say, you know what? The facts actually don't stack up with the scare campaign uh, that the opposition is running and that is explicit in Senator Cormann's question. Yes, there is an impact on electricity prices as a result of a price on carbon. It is less than, significantly less than the impact as a result of the investment in poles and wires, and the significant difference is we are providing increases to the pension, family Time tax has benefits expired. and other assistance. Time has expired, Senator Wong. Um, order. 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 Senator Ludlam. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Carr. Um, Minister, in response to several carloads of Metropolitan Police entering the building that house, houses the Ecuadorian Embassy in the middle of the night, uh, London time, uh, cordoning off the street, threatening to break the door down and threatening to rezone the Embassy, have you or the High Commissioner in London made representations to the United Kingdom to not violate the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations by entering the premises of the Ecuadorian Embassy without the consent of the head of mission? Um, Foreign Minister, I'm just interested to know whether, if any, we have made represented, uh, representations to the British government in this regard. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Mr President, uh, Australia, of course, is not a party to this decision. It is a matter between Mr Assange and the governments of Ecuador and the United Kingdom. And the court case that uh, led to this affair arising in this fashion, of course, is between Mr Assange and the government of Sweden. I am advised that Mr Assange remains in the Ecuadorian embassy, where he has been since mid-June. This morning, the Ecuadorian Foreign Minister did announce a decision would be made on his asylum claim at 10 p.m. tonight, Australian Eastern Standard Time. The outcome of Mr Assange's asylum claim, of course, is a matter for the Ecuadorian and the United Kingdom governments. The Australian government cannot intervene in the UK legal process. We have no standing in the British courts, but the government does not take up the case. Senator Bob Carr, just resume your seat. Senator Ludlam has got to his feet. President, thank you. My point of order is on a matter of relevance. I appreciate the minister's reading from a prepared brief, but it's not a brief for the question that I asked. The question I asked was whether we've made representations to the British government on the occupation of the embassy building by Metropolitan Police. That's a, that's a yes or a no question, Minister. Uh, there's, there's, there's no point of order. The Minister is answering the question, and the Minister has one minute and five seconds remaining. The Minister. Mr President, um, the, uh, the, uh, the Senator's question is based on the assumption the building has been occupied by Metropolitan Police. I haven't been advised of that. To date, there have been, I might say to the Senate, to date there have been 62 representations made by the Australian government about consular contact with Mr Assange or his legal representatives since legal proceedings commenced in 2010. Now, according to advice I've got from the department, no Australian has received more attention in a comparable space of time in terms of consular representation than Mr Assange. The, uh, this, in, this includes representations on his behalf to the government of the United Kingdom and the government of Sweden to obtain assurances of due process in current and future legal proceedings. But also, I don't think it'd, I don't think it'd be of the remotest interest to Henry Kissinger. It also includes. It also. Time has expired, said. Order, order, order. Senator Ludlam is entitled to be heard in silence. On both sides. Senator Ludlam. Thanks, President. Um, Minister, I'm going to take it that your answer to my actual question is no. Representations weren't made, and if you feel like you need to correct the record, then please do. My supplementary is because the embassy is being interfered with, Senator Evans. Minister, despite the attempts to obviously threaten and intimidate by the UK government, will the Australian government respect the decision by order? Order. Order. On both sides. I need order so. On both sides. 
on both on on both sides. Just wait, Senator Ludlam. I will give you the call when I there's silence. Waiting, You're entitled to be I'm heard waiting. in silence. Order. Senator Ludlam. Thank you, President. Will the Australian government respect the decision by Ecuadorian authorities at 10 p.m. tonight if they grant asylum to Australian citizen Julian Assange? The, the minister. Mr. President, the question of whether the Ecuadorian government grant Mr. Assange asylum is a matter for them. It's a matter for them. We'll seek information on it, but we won't make representations to them one way or the other. It's not a matter for us. It's a matter between the asylum seeker and the government of Ecuador. We have no, we have no status in the UK court system. And we don't intervene in courts where Australian citizens outside the country are engaged in any case. But I can tell the senator that we made representations to the, gov the government of Sweden, seeking assurances that were they to succeed in their extradition of Mr Assange, that he would be treated according to due process. He'd be treated, in other words, as any citizen of Sweden would be treated. And they gave us that assurance. In other words, if he came to be detained in that country, he'd have access to his lawyers and to his Time family. Time has expired. Senator Ludlam. Uh, thank you, President. I thank the minister for his answer. My second supplementary question. Um, can the minister tell the Senate what the government will do beyond providing basic consular assistance to protect Mr Assange if there is evidence that he has been subjected to political persecution by the United States government or its allies? And if so, if so can the minister describe how this intervention would differ from basic consular assistance? Minister. Well, Mr President, first might I say that that's entirely hypothetical. There is no evidence of interest in him from the United States government. If there were extradition sought of Mr Assange on a charge to which capital punishment would apply, we would oppose it. We would oppose it on principle. We would oppose it strongly. We have no evidence, however, that the United States is seeking to extradite him. And in any case, over the last two years, they had every opportunity to seek his extradition from the United Kingdom, with which the US has a robust extradition arrangement, and about which they've probably got more ease in seeking extradition than they would have were he in Sweden. But they haven't sought it. In two years, they haven't sought it. And it would be easier for them to seek extradition of him from the United Kingdom than it would be from Sweden. Any application for Mr Assange's extradition Time from has Sweden would be a matter questions. between the countries. Senator Bob Carr. Senator Humphreys. Uh, Mr President, thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Is the minister aware of recent analysis conducted by the National Centre for Social and Economic Modelling at the University of Canberra? which reveals that the carbon tax will increase costs on ACT households by an average of $9.71 per week, compared to $5.79 per week in South Australia. Can the minister explain why Canberrans should pay almost 60 per cent more under her government's carbon tax than people in her own state of South Australia? The, uh Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, uh, my recollection, and this is uh, 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 going back some time, is that one of the reasons for uh, the lesser increase in South Australia uh, was uh, that South Australia has a higher proportion of renewable energy. Uh, so, therefore, you saw a, a lower level of increase. Uh, but uh, the figures were, that were released by the various uh, states and territory, uh, uh, territories in terms of the increase in uh, prices for electricity were pretty much uh, precisely where uh, the Treasury modelling assumed um, they would be, uh, so around about a 10 per cent increase. And of course, uh, as the Senator would know, unlike the uh, s approximately 50 per cent increase that we've seen X carbon price over the last few years. Uh, in uh, electricity prices, of course, this uh, uh, price increase is associated with 
uh, the provision of increases to family tax benefit, uh, pension, as well as tax cuts, uh, all of which uh, the coalition is asserting uh, they will in fact uh, roll back and uh, remove uh, if they're to be believed of that. So uh, I would make the point to the Senator, if he's concerned about um, the pricing of electricity, uh, I would assume he would be primarily concerned by the largest component increase uh, in the price of electricity, which is not carbon, which is in fact, which is in fact uh, investment in poles and wires. And if he is so concerned about uh, the cost of living uh, for Australian families, I wonder why he voted against the school kids' bonus and why he voted against putting into the, uh, money into the pockets of Australian families, uh, Australian families to help them with the cost of schooling their children. Uh, because the reality is, Mr President, those opposites talk about worrying about cost of living, but they come in here and vote against uh, working families uh, when, when the chips are down. Senator Humphreys. Uh, I thank uh, the minister, but uh, she says that uh, the largest component of the, tax ri of the price rise has not been the carbon tax. Is she then aware that the ACT's Independent Competition and Regulatory Commission has found, and I quote, the increase in the cost of wholesale electricity is almost entirely attributable to the introduction of a price on carbon by the Australian <laughs> government? Um, can the minister explain to Canberra residents why the carbon tax component of their price hike, some 75 per cent of the rise, uh, should be so much higher than that of other Australians? Order. 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 The Minister. The Thank minister. you, Mr President. Well, again, I'd refer in, to my previous answer, which is that the vast majority over the number of years of the increases in electricity prices uh, has been as a result of investment in poles and wires. And I'd refer the senator to his colleague, Mr Turnbull, in the other place, uh, who has recognised that fact. Who has recognised that fact. I am answering the question, Senator Betts. The problem is you don't like the answer because the truth is not something you wish to discuss uh, when it comes to electricity prices, nor does the senator wish to discuss the fact uh, that the, the Australian government, through its clean energy package, is providing assistance, is providing assistance uh, to Australian households, as I said, through pensions, family tax benefit uh, and uh, increases uh, and tax cuts, all of which the coalition says they oppose. Senator Humphreys. Well, again, Mr President, um, the minister says that the government is providing assistance. Is she aware that the ACT Labor government has anal analysed this uh, the situation and found that 60 per cent of Canberra households are either uncompensated or undercompensated for the Gillard government's carbon tax price hike, and that 22 per cent of Canberrans receive no compensation whatsoever. Order. 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 The minister. Thank you. Uh, we made our decision to focus the assistance to Australian families on those who need it most. And that is people on the pension, people on family tax benefit, uh, and people earning under $80,000 a year, $80,000 a year, or who will receive a tax cut. Uh, that is nothing to do uh, with states or territory boundaries. That is the position the Labor government do, uh, took, and we stand by that. We stand by that. We stand by, stand by a Labor decision to ensure that those in Australia who need it most get the most assistance under the carbon assistance package. Now, as the senator tries to suggest that somehow you know, we've got it in for the ACT, well, I tell you what, the senator can go out and tell Canberrans why he supports, why he supports the sorts of job cuts in Canberra that we see Campbell Newman imposing on Queensland. He can go out and tell them why it is that Joe Hockey always beats his chest about he's going to take a meat axe to the Canberra Public Order. Service. That's Order. what he should go and tell Senator his constituents. Senator your time has expired. Senator Ferner. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Human Resource Services, Senator Kim Carr. How does the minister account for the rising wait times across Centrelink call times? The Minister for Human Services, Senator Kim Carr. Thank you. I thank uh, Senator Ferner for his question. This is one. This is uh, one that uh, rightly every senator and every member, of course, is uh, entitled to ask. And, and uh, as we are obviously strongly focused on the uh, issues of people waiting to actually get uh, service, it's a matter that is 
Uh, it, it is a matter of con considerable concern to this government. And I know that uh, the fact that the department at the moment, Department of Human Services, is taking 150,000 phone calls a day, and they're making some 38 million. This is Centrelink alone. 38 million phone calls in the space of a year. And so demand is extremely high and it is growing. And waiting times as a consequence, as Senator Joyce, are in fact rising. Now this is uh, no reflection. Se se Senator Kim Carr, just se Senator Joyce and Senator Conroy, I remind you, interjections across the chamber are disorderly. There have been repeat occasions where I've reminded you on this today. The minister is entitled to be heard in silence. The minister, continue. This is no reflection upon the professional staff and call centres or those who support them in the back office. It's simply a reality of public service delivery today. We are dealing with the volatility of the global economy. We are dealing with are some 150 changes in the social security system that have arisen from the improvements made by this government in the last budget. We are dealing with many more Australians who are on part pensions and have to report their income changes uh, to the department. We are dealing with calls which have much higher levels of complexity. We are also dealing with a situation where we have claims by the Liberal Party that they are going to actually take, they are going to take some 12 thousand public servants out of the Commonwealth public servants in the first two years of a Liberal government. Imagine what that's going to do to waiting times. Imagine what that's going to do to the capacity to respond to the legitimate needs of the Australian people during periods of considerable economic change. We have a situation where the average waiting times are about 12 minutes. And we are concerned that that time is growing, but taking 12,000 people out Senator won't Kim improve. Carr, Senator Fern, order. Thank you, Mr. President. Wait a minute, Senator Ferner. Can, can the minister inform the Senate what action the government is taking to reduce these waiting times? Minister. Well, first and foremost, uh, Mr. President, we're investing in our staff, uh, which is the most important asset. Uh, the Commonwealth has in, uh, in terms of human service delivery. We are putting more people on the phones. That since uh, March this year, the department has recruited 720 staff to deal with the surge in demand. The government has provided some $200 million to keep on 600 of those staff until February of next year. Second, we are redeploying staff uh, to ensure that there are, in fact, more people available to deal with waiting times. These new arrangements will, uh, with Telstra that we are developing will also provide more flexibility and provide us with further options in terms of ensuring that we can be more effective in our response to demands from the public. Third, we are working with staff so that we can provide a better service to the people actually seeking assistance from the Commonwealth. I have established a joint working group between DHS, uh, senior management, and the community and public sector union to provide order, advice order. on better Time's ways expired. of operating. Senator Thank you, Mr. President. Um, second supplementary is what role does the minister see for new technologies in responding to the demand? The minister. Well, we need, uh, of course, to ensure that new technologies provide a potent part, a potent part of the new service delivery models. And we're providing options in terms of callback. We're providing new apps to provide access, direct access for students to ensure that we can provide a better home delivery service online, as well as to freeing up resources to deal with more complex problems. But look, I'm asked what about the knuckle draggers? Well, of course, the real problem here is that the knuckles are now being taken off the ground. And in Science Week, you expect some evolution. They're taken off the ground to an attack directly into the heads of public servants. 12,000 public servants. How will that help? How will that help assist ensuring that people can get the responses they need from the Commonwealth? A 12,000 cut to the public service will undermine the capacity of this uh, or any part of this government to be able to ensure that services are delivered to the Australian people. We are now to resuming the movement. Time's from expired, Senator Carr. Senator Order. I'm waiting to call Senator McKenzie. Order. Order. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. 
I refer the minister to the fact that the carbon tax has caused an almost threefold increase in the cost of refrigerant gases for farmers, small businesses and Australian households. Ausveg, who represent Australian fruit and vegetable growers, have said that the cost of the most common refrigerant, R134A, will increase from $65.72 per kilo to $181.82 per kilo. The R404A refrigerant used by vegetable growers will increase from $92.80 per kilo to $377.71 per kilo. Given that Australian farmers are already facing difficult circumstances, uh, rising costs, the high Australian dollar and skill shortages, why is the Australian government insistent on making a bad situation worse and forcing up the cost of producing Australia's fruit and vegetables by imposing the world's biggest carbon tax? Order. Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, well, the, the good senator, um, perhaps uh, it might have been useful if the Tactics Committee have let her know that this issue has been raised uh, previously in the House. Uh, that uh, on a number of, but I'm actually trying try to be of assistance, uh, and and in fact some of. Uh, it has been quite demonstrably shown that a number of the assertions made, I think, from, for, by uh, Ms Mirabella uh, were, in fact, uh, not correct. Uh, the, uh, in fact, this has led, for example, to uh, the Australian Competi Consumer and Order. Competition— con Order. Order. The Minister. Continue. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, in late July, for example, uh, an enforceable undertaking was uh, accepted by the ACCC from uh, a refrigeration contractor, Equipserve, to correct incorrect claims regarding price increases being wholly due to the carbon price. Uh, so I would urge the senator uh, to uh, reflect uh, on the wisdom of picking up assertions, a number of which have been in the public arena for some time and which are, are not correct. Uh, the fact is, uh, the fact is uh, that uh, the Order. Go on, uh, it is the case that some wholesalers did issue price lists, lists uh, with significantly pricing, increased prices. Uh, these price increases cannot be attributed to the carbon price alone. Uh, the minister has written to various. Order. Order. Minister, continue. Thank you. Uh, the minister has written to wholesalers to ask them to justify their price increases, and, and I, I also note as I previously indicated, uh, that an enforceable undertaking has been accepted by the ACCC in relation to one particular company in South Australia. Uh, she, the, the senator referred to two, R404A, uh, etc., <coughs> and another one. I can come back to those in the supplementary. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, what does the government say to those fruit and vegetable growers and their consumers who voted for the Labor Party in 2010 based on the Prime Minister's uh, commitment, given precisely two years ago, that there would be no carbon tax under the government she led? How can Australia's fruit and vegetable growers as small business owners and their consumers who are wanting fresh, safe Australian produce trust the Labor Party again? The minister. The minister. Thank you, Mr. Th thank you, Mr. Pre president. Uh, well, what I would say to them is, do not believe the dishonest scare campaign that is being conducted. That is Sen being Senator Wong. Senator Wong, just resume your seat. Resume your seat. Order. Order. When, when there's silence, we'll proceed on both sides. Order. 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 Now, when, when, there's, when there's silence, we'll proceed. The Minister. I would say to them, do not believe the dishonest scare campaign which is being run by those opposite. Do not believe a man who suggests uh, that whole towns will be wiped off the face of the earth 
do not believe a man who says all whole, whole industries will be shut down and who has been shown to be wrong who has been shown who has been shown to be nothing other than a shameless scaremonger i'll give the senator some examples the typical cost per year for example to fill the le a leak from a domestic refrigerator as a result of a carbon of the increased carbon price is about 8 cents 8 cents a the typical cost per year to fill a leak for a passenger vehicle is about $2.70 now the price increases are nothing like what is being asserted by those opposite? It's another example of a shameless, Time dishonest has expired, scare campaign. Senator Wong. Order, order, order. Sen Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. I refer to the fact that Coles and Woolworths have refused to allow Australia's fruit and vegetable growers to pass on any of their costs associated with the carbon tax. The government has empowered the ACCC to prevent those with market power from increasing their prices in a misleading and deceptive way. What steps has the government uh, taken to ensure that companies with market buying power prevent Australian farmers and small businesses from passing on legitimate cost increases? The Minister. Mr President, with respect, that is a completely different question. It's a question about ACCC powers. I, I, refer the, I refer the Senator to the answer I gave yesterday to Senator Xenophon, in which I outlined, I think, uh, in quite amount of detail, uh, the government's position on the issue she raises. It has nothing to do, it has nothing to do with the first the primary question nor the supplementary. But I also would make this point. I also would make this point. Order. Oh, her, her Majesty order. is on his feet. Order. Her order. Majesty is order. on his feet. I'm afraid you Order, know, Senator James Wong, Wong resume your seat. Order. No, Senator Brandis was on his feet before you, Senator McKenzie. I, I, Senator Brandis. Mr. President, the minister cannot refuse to answer a question, as she has just done. She could take a point of order, but she has not done so. Having chosen not to take a point of order, it is not an acceptable answer for the minister to refuse to answer the question. Oh, Senator Brandis, there is no point of order there. Sen Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Um, actually, just uh, for no. the minister's— No. Uh, are, you, are you seeking a point of order, I am or what are you doing? Order. Sorry? I, my question relates to the Is impact of the Is it a point of, of order that you're seeking? A, a point of clarification, yes. No, it's got to be a point of order. Point of order? Right. If, if, if it's a point of order, you may proceed. Order. My second supplementary uh, refers to the previous supplementary and the original question in the fact that it's the carbon tax's impact on fruit and, fruit and vegetable growers of Australia. Order. There's, there's no point of order. The minister is answering the question. The minister has 35 seconds. Order! The minister has 35 seconds. The, the order on both sides, the minister. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the expectation is refrigerated goods like milk, fruit and vegetables are expected to increase by about 0.4 per cent under the carbon price. This includes the impact of increased refrigeration and electricity costs, and this part of the total increase has been factored into uh, the Treasury assumptions which have led to the household assistance of $10.10 per week. Uh, the Treasury assumption is that uh, we are looking at about a dollar per week for an average household in food prices. We are providing around, on average, $10.10 .10 per week in assistance. Senator Madigan. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. <coughs> minister, my question relates to the effectiveness of Australia's economic and industry policies to support our manufacturing industries. In light of reports in this week's financial review that Australian manufacturing industry has shed 125,000 jobs over the last four years, the deindustrialisation of Australia we were previously warned about from US economist and strategist Edward Lutvik, ABC Late, Late Line, 7th of September 2010, appears to be coming to pass. Can the minister advise that the specific manufacturing, trade and economic policies the federal government has adopted to protect ourselves from deindustrialisation 
in line with Mr Lutvak's advice that we disenthrall ourselves of 19th century free trade theory that doesn't work. Order. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Madigan for his question. I acknowledge he's uh, deeply interested in the manufacturing issues in this country. Uh, while he is right to point to uh, the very serious loss of uh, jobs across the, the manufacturing sector, I think it's important to remember, though, that the sector still employs one million Australians. It's still a very, very important part of our, uh, our economy and is very important to many families in this country. And Mr President, while uh, some jobs are being lost, there are also areas uh, of growth. But it is the case, Mr President, that uh, manufacturing is facing some very difficult times. And that's why uh, the Labor government is investing in the industry to support jobs, to retain skills and to maintain a strong economy. We are conscious that manufacturers are doing it tough with the high Australian dollar and obviously competition from imports. But in the end, Mr. President, innovation and productivity are the keys for our manufacturers, manufacturers to remain sustainable, internationally competitive and make the move to a low carbon economy. Now, we obviously have a range of uh, policies to drive innovation and productivity, many in my own uh, sector of education and skills, to, to help the uh, manufacturing sector and to support the jobs it creates. Um, I think it is uh, very important, and this is a focus for this government, to ensure that Australian manufacturers have access to major projects and the global supply chain opportunities. I know that's been a big issue for people, but how they get those access to those global supply chain opportunities. I would point out that the Clean Energy Future Package is one of the most important industry and innovation policies this nation has ever seen. Over $15 billion will be invested in creating the jobs of tomorrow, many notice, notably in manufacturing. There are obviously, in addition, Mr. Brennan, a range of uh, government programs that look to support uh, innovation and growth in our manufacturing sector. Order. Time's expired. Senator Madigan. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise of the strategies being employed by the federal government to support Australian manufacturers in light of the industry subsidisation and currency devaluation China uses to support its domestic manufacturers and China's rapid industrialisation? The minister. Um, Mr. President, um, <coughs> I think the, uh, the, the sort of answer in terms of the big picture is to say that Australia will only be competitive if we have a higher skilled, higher educated workforce and are innovative and have high productivity. We are in more competitive times. We are disadvantaged by, in some ways by the strength of the Australian dollar. But that's why there's a range of government programs like Commercialisation Australia, the R&D tax incentive, the work of the cooperative research centres, CSIRO, all of those things uh, trying to uh, build manufacturing. And Mr President, in my own portfolio, we've got the National Workforce Development Fund. And I've been to manufacturers who are using that fund, uh, uh, L&M radiators in Perth, selling now to Eastern Europe. Uh, WH Williams in Sydney, your metal, metal uh, manufacturing company, who are growing their market as they get more innovative and get more out of the workforce. So there are also some really great stories about companies adapting and, and being smarter. If Time's you like. expired, Senator Evans. Uh, Senator, Senator Madigan. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise if Australia's economic and industry policies are working so well, why have 125,000 jobs been shed from Australia's manufacturing sector over the last four years? The minister. Well, I think uh, I think it's also the case, Senator, that there were tens of thousands of people employed as typists and blacksmiths in the old days, and they're no longer positions in our workforce. The reality is the economy changes. Jobs grow in some sectors and are made redundant in others, as are by technology or other factors. But, but it is a serious concern because manufacturing is so central to uh, our, our economic uh, uh, well-being. And that's why, Mr. President, the Prime Minister uh, created the Manufacturing Task Force to see, in a bipartisan way between unions and employers, how we could protect and grow the sector. They handed down their report this morning, uh, and I refer the uh, senator to that report. It's a, it's a, a report that attempts to look at the future of manufacturing, how we can set out our plans for supporting it, 
And I think uh, it will be an important basis for future government policy as we respond to this very important report. Senator Fifield. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Disability Reform, Senator Evans. As the minister would be aware, uh, there is strong cross-party support for a national disability insurance scheme. And, it, and in that context— Order! 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 Order on my right. Senator Fifield is entitled to be heard in silence. Order. Senator Fifield. Thank you. In, in that context, and on behalf of Australians with disability, my question is why, given the Productivity Commission recommended $3.9 billion of Commonwealth expenditure to support the first phase of the NDIS, has the government only allocated $1 billion over the forward estimates? And given this discrepancy, uh, how can the first phase of the NDIS be completed? Order. 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 The minister, the minister <coughs> representing the Minister for Disability Reform, Senator Evans. Mr. President, I thank uh, the Senator for his question. I think uh, Senator McEwen made the pertinent point. It's all very well to wear the T-shirt and say you support the NDIS. It's a question about whether you actually show that support, whether you actually commit funds to it. And really, the, re the, the, the reality now in Australian politics is there's only one uh, party in this country who's actually putting money up. Who's actually putting money up? I've listened. I've listened to the opposition spokesman, uh, Treasury spokesman Joe Hockey, on the subject, and he made it very clear, very clear, that there is no commitment from the Liberal National Party to fund this. So, Mr. President, I will not be lectured uh, by the senator about commitment to this uh, scheme. What this government has done, Mr. President, is commit one billion dollars to the trial phase. One billion dollars to the trial phase. Real money on the table. And, Mr. President, as a result of that financial commitment, we have got support from the state governments, many of them coalition governments, to the, for the trial to go ahead. The first stage, sorry, not the trial. The first stage to go ahead. So, Mr. President, we're not just mouthing the rhetoric. We're getting on with making this work. We commissioned the report. We've responded to it. We've allocated one billion dollars to make sure the first stage works. We've now reached agreement with New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia. Tasmania and the Australian Capital Territory for launch sites. We have insisted, and they have responded by putting real money on the table. Order, order, Senator Evans. Senator Fifield has got to his feet. Order, order. Senator Fifield. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. A point of order. Um, my question was. Uh, how does the minister account for the discrepancy between the $3.9 billion the Productivity Commission said was necessary to deliver the first phase of the NDIS and the $1 billion that the government has allocated? You can't complete the first phase with almost $3 billion less than the Productivity Commission said was necessary. Order. Uh, there's no point of order. I believe the minister is answering the question. I'm listening to the minister's answer. He has 30 seconds remaining. The minister. Mr. President, uh, the senator would have more credibility if he said the Liberal coalition was supporting an expenditure of $3.9 billion. But they're not. But they're not. Mr. President, we responded to the Productivity Commission report by, by uh, planning a first stage and funding that first stage. That's happening. That's happening. That's being rolled out on the ground now, Mr. President. And we have got even coalition states to come to the party and help fund this. And I think the senator ought to focus on supporting Time's it expired. rather than trying to nitpick. Time has expired. Senator Fifield. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I have been asked by many Australians with disability to inquire of the government uh, if they are indeed committed to both fully fund a national rollout of the NDIS and to achieving the Productivity Commission's target uh, date of completion of 2018-19. Has the government committed to 2018-19 and has the government committed to fund a full national rollout? The, the Minister. Um, Mr President, uh, we've started to build the national scheme 
and from 2018, under this government, we will have an NDIS. So I'm interested to know when the senator is asked, will you ask the government, will you ask the government whether they are fully committed, whether they have committed to funding it? I suspect they also ask you, is the Liberal National Coalition? And I wonder, Senator, are you honest with them? Are you honest with them? Do you tell them you have committed nothing? Do you tell them that the shadow uh, spokesman for the Treasury has made it clear that you cannot add to the $70 billion black hole anymore, that you have committed to paying back the big mining companies the super tax, and that will drive every expenditure cut you have to make and prevent you implementing new programs like the NDS, NDIS. That's the reality. This government has, is committed to the NDIS. We're funding it and we're rolling it out. That is in sharp contrast to the Liberals' uh, Time commitment. Time has expired. Order. Senator Fifield. Uh, Mr President, uh, through you, uh, could I ask the minister, and take it on notice if you need to, minister, whether the government will reconsider its rejection of Mr Abbott's proposal to establish a joint parliamentary committee chaired by both sides of politics to oversee the implementation of the NDIS, a proposal that would see the NDIS owned by the parliament order. as a whole. Order. 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 When there's silence, the minister. Mr. President, uh, I think the uh, senator might have missed the key point. We're actually getting on with it. We're doing it. We're actually doing it. And Mr. President, interestingly, we are doing it with the cooperation of uh, many state premiers. And I think if the Liberal opposition in this chamber wants to show that this is possible and that they can support it. Let's see you commit to funding it. Let's see you be honest and say, I'm not just going to wear the T-shirt. I'm not just going to say yes to everybody when they ask me the question. I'm going to be honest to them and say, this is how much I'll put on the table. This is how order, much the Liberal Party order, will put on the table. Order, order, order. Senator Fifield, order. Senator Fifield. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Deputy President, uh, sorry, Mr. President, um, on the relevance. Uh, my question to the minister was whether the government is prepared to accept the hand of bipartisanship and whether the minister is prepared to convey to the Prime Minister again the request that there be a joint committee established to oversee the implementation. Order. Not a talk Order. fest to oversee the implementation. Order. Order. I believe the minister is answering the question. The minister has 26 seconds if he has anything further. I think it's clear, it, it should be clear to people we're dealing with the people who have some relevance. Some people who have some relevance. The state governments have some relevance because they are making a financial commitment, not just mouthing platitudes, Mr. President. We'll continue to work with those who show real commitment to the scheme, and I suggest the Senator spend his time talking to the Premier of Queensland, Mr Newman, about whether he's prepared to support the scheme. That would be a use, time useful has, use, order, use of his time. Order, order. Time has expired. Senator Evans. Could I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper, Mr President? Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Back. Take note of answers given by Senators Evans and Wong to questions asked by Senators Abetz, Cormann, Humphreys and Mackenzie. Deputy President, we just saw the most lamentable circumstance in this chamber this afternoon when the leader of the Labor Party in this place, Senator Evans, in response to a question from Senator Abetz, made the statement that the Coalition has no interest in the big policies of the day. Mr Deputy President, is it the case then that when there are lies from a Prime Minister, they are of no interest to the community, that being there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead? And when is it that a policy as profound as a carbon dioxide tax is of no interest to the Australian community? Is this government, Mr Deputy President, so far removed from the mood of the Australian people that in fact when their own members and their own candidates started door knocking, even in their own areas of interest, they found they had to stop door knocking simply because so many in the electorate are so angry with them about what Senator Evans dismisses as being events of no policy interest. 
Is it little wonder that none of the members are using either the Labor brand or the Labor colours? I refer to advertisement recently by Ms Melissa Park in Fremantle, one seat which once would have been seen as a safe seat in Western Australia, Deputy President, when she did not even mention the word Labor or the Labor brand in her electioneering campaigning. It is interesting, isn't it, Mr Deputy President, that Mr Paul Henderson in the in Northern Territory and Mr Mark McGowan in Western Australia have no interest in this Prime Minister coming to either the Territory or to WA to support them in their forthcoming election campaigns. It is amazing, it is absolutely amazing, Mr Deputy President, the fact that the polls show what the Labor Party know and maybe they should start door knocking again so that they can get some genuine feedback from the election. And what they will learn, what they will learn is the community is very, very interested in the big policy of the day, including the carbon dioxide tax, and they will also be interested in knowing that Australians are embarrassed by a Prime Minister who can't tell the truth. For example, we have heard from the government time and again compensation by many in this community in terms of the $23 per tonne carbon tax and its effect on energy. We heard from Senator Humphreys here today, Mr Deputy President, what that impact is going to be on the community in the ACT, and clearly many of them have not been compensated. But what the Prime Minister didn't say to the Australian community, Deputy President, is what happens in the second and in subsequent years. If they got compensated this year when the carbon tax is $23 a tonne, what's going to happen next year when it jumps to $25 and then $27 and even $40 a tonne if indeed this government remained in power before a coalition government came in and disbands this carbon tax. How many people have been told what the compensation will be next year? And already, already we know from our electorates around Australia that those people who were compensated have spent those funds and have not yet faced the payment of those increased power bills. We heard from Senator Mackenzie in her question to Senator Wong, who was very, very scant in her efforts to answer it. What is happening to those involved in the storage of any refrigerated goods, be it fruit storage, meat storage or whatever? We have heard the horrific prices now being charged to abattoir owners and meat processors as a result of the increased power charges. Deputy President, what about the businesses? who are already being affected by this carbon dioxide tax. Even the term carbon tax, Senator Stirl would be wise to stop and listen, because he too is well aware of the cost impost on the trucking industry, one which he used to proudly represent in this chamber. But of course he wants to leave so that he doesn't have to answer his own colleagues from the trucking industry and what the costs are. The exporters um, Deputy President, those who are now facing competition overseas from suppliers who are not subject to this carbon tax, our own import competing businesses who all of a sudden have a chain around their necks because cheap imports are not the subject of this carbon dioxide tax. The vehicle manufacturing industry, which so generously receives subsidies from this government, is having an impost of some $400 per vehicle placed on top of it. Already, already 800,000 of the million cars that are bought each year are imported. Where is the logic in turning around and imposing that tax? And of course, finally, in the few seconds, the magnetite iron ore industry in Western Australia decimated or, by uh, this tax. Senator Back, your time has expired. I'm Senator Furner. To that, President, well, it's no surprise today the scare campaign is still alive and well from those opposite. And that's consistently what they've been doing all along on, the, on this issue concerning carbon price. And uh, there were quite a number of relevant uh, responses. Uh, presented to the uh, opposition today from um, Minister Wong in regards to a lot of the furfies, a lot of the myths and a lot of the, the untruths that those opposite are peddling to substantiate their, their scare campaign to make sure that they try and sneak out there in the dark wherever they can, uh, touch on people, whether it be in, in their backyards, whether it can be in wrecking yards, whether it can be in bakeries and lately in tuck shops. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine going into tuck shops. How low can you go? How low can you go going to tuck shops, scaring school children? 
And let's not forget the fact that those opposite voted to get the school kids' bonus, Deputy President. Um, I had no problem the other weekend at a show, an agriculture show in my electorate, uh, Pine Rivers, where people were coming up to me and not one of them, surprising enough, mentioned the carbon price. But they were, they were very enthusiastic to sign a petition, Deputy President, that we had on our table about why the Queensland government isn't committed to an NDIS program. That's one thing, I guess, those that are Queenslanders, none of them there, oh, there's Senator Boyce, Senator Boyce opposite. I'm sure she's out there telling Campbell Newman, let's do something about this NDIS. Let's get on board. Let's go to the COAG meeting and put some sort of commitment forward to the uh, COAG to support it, like those other coalition states like Victoria and New South Wales have done. But Campbell Newman came to the table with nothing, with zero. In fact, just about th those, pages, those pages of the petition, uh, Deputy President, that I had filled at the show were overwhelmingly but rather than commit money to an NDIS program, Campbell Newman is prepared to spend $80 million on the racing industry. And some of that $80 million is going to a goat track, a new goat track out of, out of Bar Calden. I don't mind Bar Calden because that is the birthplace of the Australian Labor Party. It's a place that should be recognised and honoured. But imagine spending $80 million, $80 million on the racing program or uh, industry and not willing to commit one cent not one cent to an NDIS program. You should be ashamed of yourselves, you Queensland senators. But going back to the other issues that were raised today in the questions surrounding the, the issues and the questions about the carbon price, uh, Senator Wong, quite poignant, made out the, the, the relevance about what has been created since we have been in, in, in parliament. As a Labor government, we have created 810,000 jobs. And there's something that you opposite there, I guess, are, are uh, very, very um, concerned about because we're actually c contributing to the economy, doing something about uh, the situation in, in the world. And it's something that I find every ambassador that appears before the, the Joint Standing Committee of Foreign Defence, Defence and Trade come and commend us as a government in the manner in which we handled the global financial crisis. Yet, once again, going back to my home state, we have a Premier that talks down the economy talks down the economy, wants to try and label it as a situation of comparing Queensland with the economy in Spain. How atrocious! How, yeah, what employment rate has, has, has Spain got? 25 per cent, actually. 25 per cent unemployment rate in Spain. What do we have in Queensland? We have around about 5.8 per cent employment rate, and it's getting worse. It's getting worse, Deputy um, uh, Prime Minister, because Deputy President, the, the Premier in Queensland, Campbell Newman, is sacking the workforce in the public service. He's got a target of 20,000 jobs to go, and you, you can really appreciate what that is going to do to the services that people rely upon—20,000 public servants. And that's why those opposite, if they ever get into um, parliament, get into government, we know what they will be doing. And, Senator um, Kim Carr pointed out today the objective of, of certainly uh, Mr. Mr Abbott would be to sack 12,000 public servants, and I'm sure that's only a start to it—12,000 and more to come. And The example that's been provided in Queensland of 20,000 jobs that are going to be terminated, taken off what they call as non-frontline -front employment, will disappear out of this uh, capital and di disappear out of this country as a result of funding the coalition's 70 billion black hole. That's what they have to do. They'll be taking money away from pensioners. They'll be sacking uh, public servants right across the countryside should we ever be in an unfortunate Order. situation of getting a coalition government in, in this house, uh, Deputy President. So once again, um, Senator all the untruths have been told to by expired. those opposite have been— Senator Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I'll just take those uh, slip of the tongue of Senator Fernand there referring to you as uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister. I mean, I could see that. Uh, yeah. Nationals leader in the lower house and the coalition governor. I think that'd be a pretty good line. But no, no, we're talking about uh, talking about a coalition. It'd be a fine Deputy Prime Minister, as he is a fine Deputy President. <laughs> So I'll continue on with the interjections uh, from the young lady stop on the other side, Mr. Deputy President. Just talking about the answer to the carbon. <laughs> you give a compliment and you get ridiculed for it. It's a strange place, this. 
Referring to the questions today in relation to the carbon tax, Senator Ferner made some points then about Premier Campbell Newman uh, not contributing with any money to the uh, NDIS. Well, there's a serious problem in Queensland. Uh, they have a serious government debt. They're currently, I think, on around $70 billion. This is just for four and a half million people, Mr Deputy President, uh, expected to go to some $80 billion by 2015 and some $100 billion by 2017-2018. Any wonder Queensland's tightening the belt, but the point I make is about the carbon tax. What a time to put it on their economy, the extra costs uh, at a time when they are struggling, when they have huge government debt. We know they've got the huge government debt. We know there's a Labor government prior to this new coalition government, Liberal National Party government in Queensland. We know it's through the history of my life that every time a Labor Party is thrown out of government, whether it be state or federal, the checkbook is empty. Usually overdraft is maxed out. And sadly, Queensland that was debt-free for decades after decades under coalition government is now wallowing in debt and uh, in serious debt too. This is not a laughing matter. This is a serious problem they have in Queensland, and if less hard decisions are made, they will not correct themselves. They will go down the gurgler. And that's why we say a carbon tax at this time. My colleague Senator McKenzie highlighted about on the, uh, with Ausveg and the, the vegetable, fruit and vegetable industries. It's quite clear that rural Australia, regional Australia, is going to be hit the hardest. We already have the highest electricity prices. We already have the highest freight charges. We already have the highest cost of doing business because of a lot of those freight components. And yet, this is going to add more. And they talk about 10 per cent. There's an 18 per cent increase in electricity charges as of the 1st of July in New South Wales. I part the independent body has put up put the price up 18 per cent. 50 per cent of that cost of electricity uh, rise is due to the carbon tax, 50 per cent of the increase of that rise in electricity. To achieve what? That is the point. And I want to just follow on from uh, Senator Back's comments there about the transport industry. This is the craziest part of this policy. That, I mean, there are many, many crazy parts of this whole carbon tax, but to think on July 1, 2014, the government and many of them sit over there, Mr Deputy President, colleagues of the Transport Workers' Union. Senator Stirl, a truckie, I spend a lot of time in, in trucks myself. A Senator Conroy, a big supporter of the Transport Workers' Union. And they are going to add another $515 million fuel tax to our transport industry, uh, to the eight, 8 billion litres of diesel that the truckies use around Australia. And this is going to change the planet. The transport industry has done such a great job with their new uh, modern motors, their Euro 4s, where the pollution for them is, is basically zero uh, compared to the older motors, yet they're going to hit the transport industry, which will of course have the most devastating effect once again on rural Australia, where in a town like where I live we have no rail, so everything comes into the town by road, everything goes out by road, whether it be the thousand head of beef that are slaughtered each day at Bindery Beef Abattoirs, a business I'm so proud of to be based in my uh, home country town, they will pay the extra freight charges. That is unless there's a change of government come next election. And speaking of that, $1.7 million the first year, addition to the cost of abattoir running at Inverell. That was a Senate inquiry. The figures came forward. $1.74 million extra cost. But their competitors in America and overseas uh, we compete against uh, those in the markets in Korea and, uh, and Japan, etc., the, the beef markets. They don't have those costs. We are removing the competitive edge of our, our economy, especially those rural e economies where we, we rely so much on the export of our agricultural produce and products and our minerals, of course. So, look, two years since uh, Prime Minister Miss Gillard made that promise, now that broken promise, and it will haunt her to her political grave. Thank you, Senator Williams. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, it's Groundhog Day on carbon price yet again in this place, and over and over and over again. Every question time, we seem to go through this topic over and over again. But you know, it's wearing very thin, and pleasingly, the opposition can't score a point. You know, because. Your scare campaign is wearing very, it's now very tired. It's very, very, very convenient for the, those opposite simply to make the facts of this debate up. You don't rely on the facts. 
You are simply misleading the Australian public with your scare campaign. As Senator Mackenzie's discredited question shows, as clearly exposed by Senator Wong's answer, the political tactic that the opposition has displayed in in taking a multitude of price rises, a multitude of price rises across the Australian economy that are due to any number of other different factors, and blaming it all on the price on carbon. It happens day in and day out. And you know, you even put it in your pamphlets to the Australian public. So here you go. Here we've got a, a letter from uh, uh, Mr. Michael Keenan, the member for Stirling. You know, he talks about. Electricity prices going up by 66 per cent, and you know, and then he goes, plus carbon tax. Well, you know, well, what does plus carbon tax actually really mean? Well, that 66 per cent is Colin Barnett, is Colin Barnett, the, who has driven up Western Australia's electricity prices by 66 per cent in that state, and that is the penalty that Western Australians are paying. So, you know, do you want to know really what price rises under the carbon price actually look like? You know, you can actually Order talk on about my left. Order. what genuine price increases actually mean. So let's talk about what genuine price increases. So I was very pleased last week to be talking to Mr Adam McHugh, who's a Murdoch University researcher and economist, and he's been looking at the mathematical modelling that looks at price rises. So he thought, well, we were talking about pies before, were we? Well, let's take pies and let's take perhaps birthday cakes. Let's take birthday cakes, which uh, clearly are uh, something that we like to use as a political as a political example. Well, 12. So you know our national accounts data show show the prices in 1,200 commodities. So you can know you can drill right down to the ingredients of a birthday cake, just as Mr. McHugh has done, to actually legitimately look at what price rises actually can legitimately be attributed to. Uh, in relation to the carbon price. And to be honest, it's very, very similar to what the ACCC has to do when it looks at whether companies are legitimately passing on uh, price increases that are related to a carbon price or whether they're actually price increases that should be attributed to other increasing costs. You know, so what did Mr McHugh find? Well, he found by looking at the inputs into a birthday cake uh, and doing a complete lifestyle assessment, life cycle assessment of a birthday cake, right through the supply chain of a birthday cake, what did it add up to? You know, for a $25 birthday cake, what was the price increase? It was a massive 10 cents. Well, yes, Senator Ludlam, you were there at that very briefing, and you know it was just 10 cents. And I would really like to refer senators in this place to really get a grip on what the real-life cost increases of um, carbon pricing actually are. And so, when I say this is wearing thin, it is indeed wearing thin. And you know why? Because the Australian public, after a very sustained uh, scare campaign, you know that many people have been susceptible to. You know they're actually starting to wise up because you know as of July 1, you can actually see the reality of what price increases relating to the carbon price actually start to look like. You order, know, order, Senator Boyce, your next Senator thank Boyce. Thank you very order. much, uh, Mr. President. So when it comes to the issue of carbon, I'm very proud of the leadership that our Prime Minister has shown on this question, and I'm very proud of the policy focus that we have taken that shows. The, the leadership that we've taken on carbon that is indeed in the national interest. The absurdity of their questioning uh, in relation to uh, the Prime Minister and her, her leadership, as Minister Evans highlighted, what we are about is being focused on our government's agenda. Order. Your time has expired, Senator Pratt. Senator Boyce. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. Well, uh, there certainly is something wearing very thin around uh, Australia, around the nation. But it's the patience of the Australian people with this inept government, and it's wearing thinner and thinner and thinner as time goes on. What they want, and the thing that they say to me, they actually do talk about something 
before they mention the carbon tax when I speak to constituents and manufacturers and people who create jobs. The thing they mention before they mention the carbon tax is the desperate, desperate need for an election in this country. That's what the first thing they want to talk about, and their patience is wearing very, very thin. But let's talk about the, the fact that we are today uh, celebrating is certainly the wrong word, but looking at the second anniversary of the current Prime Minister's broken promise on carbon tax. The fact that a government that she led would never, ever introduce a carbon tax, and yet here we are with the problems developing. And I must admit I cannot help but be completely bemused by the comments made by Senator Wong in answer to the questions that she had, or the comments made just then by Senator Pratt. A birthday cake goes up 10 cents, so the carbon tax is all right. Refrigerant gas will lead to a 0.4 per cent increase in costs for a household over a year, and that's all right. Electricity prices have gone up 50 per cent and will rise further, and that's all right. So what we have is increment after increment after increment desperately affecting everyone in this country. If uh, Senator Ferner managed to get out of town a bit, he'd know that it's not just fruit and vegetable growers who are very concerned about the, the ri rise in refrigerant costs. It's graziers in western and northern Queensland as well. It's the fishing fleets, it's the prawning fleets of far northern Queensland who are terrified of what's happening with refrigerant price increases refrigerant gas price increases for a start and all the other imposts that are building up one after the other after the other because of this government's carbon tax and it's uh, senator pratt appears to want to claim that every price increase is the problem of a liberal premier and uh, everything else is somehow uh, to be uh, all the the good events are to be uh, sheeted home to the Labor Prime Minister. I'm, unfortunately, you can't have it that way. You are, you have to take some responsibility for the results of your uh, actions or lack of them in the case of this government. And let's just look at the. Uh, forum that's been happening in Parliament House in the last few days, the CEO forum, um, with the uh, Australian heads of uh, over 100 international companies talking about how they feel about this government. 60 per cent of those uh, 150 chief executives in Parliament House this week, 60 per cent of them say they are dismayed at Canberra's increased policy uncertainty. 45 per cent of them uh, say they are less likely to invest in Australia in the future. And they, they claim that uh, not the biggest problem, the biggest problem of all, of course, in, in terms of this policy uncertainty and what the heck is going on, is the carbon tax. 36 per cent of those executives, the, the, one, the biggest issue of the lot was um, the carbon scheme. And, uh, they make the point that uh, until they have some certainty from this government, they cannot proceed. Now, how, of course, can you have certainty with a government that's being cobbled together with a group that would like to see the carbon tax put, uh, with the Greens who want the carbon tax put at such unrealistic levels that it would destroy manufacturing and destroy business in Australia, and led by a woman who two years ago promised that no government that she was involved in would ever have a carbon tax. We cannot have any faith whatsoever that this is not going to just get worse and worse. Um, and one of the other course, it, big concerns of foreign executives is if this government is to proceed with the carbon tax, why on earth won't they look at some sort of uh, equivalent Order. market Senator price? Bruce, your time has expired. On the same matter, Senator Ludlam. No, Deputy uh, President, uh, on a completely I'll, different matter. I'll just put the question. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Back be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ludden, you still 
wish to move a motion to take note of answers today? Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I am uh, moving a motion uh, that the Senate take note of the question. Uh, or the answer, I should say, that uh, Foreign Affairs Minister Senator Carr chose not to provide to the chamber uh, earlier this afternoon in response to questions that I put to him about the situation unfolding in London uh, overnight. And um, my question, obviously, was, was as is the format of this place was threefold, but effectively it goes to whether the minister was aware, had taken an interest, had contacted our High Commissioner, or particularly and specifically made representations to the British government, either here, uh, their representatives here in Australia or in London, uh, as to why they appear to have uh, breached international law, threatened the integrity and the, uh, potentially the staff of Ecuador's embassy in London in their pursuit of uh, Australian citizen Julian Assange, who's obviously been in that embassy since June. And the minister was, as he always is, on message, completely <coughs> off topic. But he was at least on message. I think I could just about have read the brief that he read into the chamber because I've heard it so many times. I nearly, I've nearly memorised it. It doesn't matter what question you put to him, you get the same thing back. Um, the reason I ask this is that the actions of the British government, if this turns out to be correct, and there's a, there are, is a lot of rumour and speculation flying around at the moment as to what actually has occurred, but it appears from the statement. Um, certainly from the statement uh, made by the government of Ecuador that said this morning, we are deeply shocked by British government threats against the sovereignty of the Ecuadorian embassy and their suggestion that they may forcibly enter the embassy. So it's been surrounded by units of the Metropolitan Police and goodness knows who else. The British government appears to have threatened to break the door down or potentially even rezone the embassy so that it's no longer diplomatic territory. This puts every embassy in the world at risk, this kind of behaviour. Can you imagine what Minister Carr's response would be, quite rightly, if the Australian government embassy was surrounded by elements of the Afghan National Police in Kabul? Just imagine that for a moment. The idea that diplomatic staff and that territory—and this is hundreds of years of international law, not decades—that you do not interfere with the diplomatic postings and personnel overseas, and that is now being threatened to be uh, unpicked by the actions or the apparent actions. Of the, of the British government in London in pursuit of somebody who hasn't been charged with any offence in any jurisdiction. He's wanted for questioning by Swedish prosecutors who have failed to take the opportunity of two years when Mr Assange has been under house arrest to question him. But that's what he's wanted for, an Interpol red notice, an extradition order for questioning on offences in Sweden. And now the British police appear to have entered the building, so the embassy, I understand, is on the fifth floor of a building in Knightsbridge in London, and the British police have surrounded and occupied the ground floor of that building. Minister Carr then, uh, after having as long as any of us have had to take stock of the situation, plus the advantage of at least being able to call our High Commissioner in London to work out uh, what exactly is going on, says, oh, I haven't been advised. I haven't been advised. You might as well walk in here with a blindfold on. Seek advice. Find out what is occurring, because I think uh, many people would like to know what's going on. I think it would be, uh, and, and already is, in effect, a massive diplomatic incident. Should the British, in fact, decide to do that, to occupy the embassy or to forcibly enter that premise? Article 22 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations says that the premises of the mission should be inviolable. The agents of the receiving state may not enter them except with a consent of the head of the mission. And that is the kind of threat that appears to be posed to the staff of the Ecuadorian Embassy in London at the moment in pursuit of an Australian citizen. This is not a matter that the Australian government can stand back in blissful ignorance for very much longer. This is something that concerns us directly. We're not asking for further consular assistance. Consular assistance is for people who lose their mobile phones or their passports overseas. Consular assistance is for teenagers who are found with small quantities of drugs in Bali and therefore put at risk. Consular assistance is not what is being asked for here. It's not what is sought. It is diplomatic and political assistance. Does the United States government intend to prosecute Julian Assange for espionage, computer hacking offences or whatever it may be? This unprecedented in nature and scale investigation that was launched nearly two years ago now, does the US government intend to pull the trigger and unleash that prosecution or not? Because that's what this is about. It's what it's always been about. I hope the next time that this uh, issue is raised in the Senate, which will probably be pretty early depending on events that are uh, unfolding right now, 
The Foreign Minister won't walk in here with a blindfold in and claim that he wasn't advised. It's not good enough. Thank you, Senator Ludlam. The question is the motion moved by Senator Ludlam be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any ministerial statements? No ministerial statements. Are there any government responses to committee reports? Minister Wong. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I present three government responses to committee reports as listed at item 13 on today's order of business and in accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the documents incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I table documents providing details of travelling allowance payments made by the Department of the Senate to Senators and members during the period 1 July 2011 to 30 June 2012 and travel expenditure for the Department of the Senate during the same period. Are there any documents to be tabled by ministers? None. Are there any reports from committees? Senator Birmingham. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I present two reports of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, report number 127 into treaties tabled on 20 March and 8 May 2012, and report number 128, the inquiry into the Treaties Ratification Bill 2012. And I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the reports. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the reports, and I thank the Senate for the leave to do so. Mr Deputy President, in presenting these two reports, I'll touch briefly on some of the issues in which they canvass. Uh, firstly, the report number 127, which contains the committee's views on a series of treaties which were tabled on 20 March and 8 May 2012. One of the more important treaties covered in this report is the exchange of notes constituting an agreement between Australia and the United States of America to amend and extend the agreement on cooperation in defence logistics support. The exchange of notes will extend the agreement on cooperation in defence logistics support for a period of 11 years and ensure that Australia's bilateral defence logistics cooperation with the United States remains on a sound footing. The agreement's continued operation is important to the Australia-United States military relationship because it enables the reciprocal provision of logistical military support. It also provides for the establishment of maintenance programs which enhance industry capability and contribute to Australia's military preparedness and interoperability of US, with US forces. As most members, I would hope all members in this place recognise, Australia's defence relationship with the United States is our most important defence relationship. The ANZUS Alliance, now in effect for over 60 years, is the cornerstone of that relationship and subsequent agreements, such as this one, help to facilitate that defence relationship. Given the increased cooperation and activity between the US and Australian Defence Forces over the past decade, this exchange of notes is both logical and practical. It will help to, facil it will help to facilitate ongoing operations in Afghanistan, as well as the deployment of the US Marines to the Northern Territory. The Joint Standing Committee on Treaties did, however, note, Mr Deputy President, that this agreement is currently used infrequently and could perhaps better serve Australia's interests if some of the provisions within the logistical support agreement were more fully utilised, especially in the area of Australian access to US equipment and industry. From evidence the committee received, it appears as though the agreement's potential has perhaps not been explored as thoroughly as it could be, and we would certainly urge uh, those officials involved in defence to look at how it could be enhanced to Australia's defence industry benefit. The committee also approved an extension to the 1987 Regional Cooperative Agreement for Research, Development and Training related to nuclear science and technology. The Regional Cooperative Agreement is a useful mechanism in providing a regional framework for initiating cooperative projects and coordinated research between international atomic energy agreement member states in the Asia-Pacific. Its continued operation over a 40-year period provides tangible evidence of its usefulness. Although the RCA's role in the non-proliferation architecture is limited, it does perform a role in promoting non-proliferation objectives. Furthermore, as part of a broader regulatory architecture for nuclear activities, it also plays a role in implementing improved standards following events such as those that occurred tragically at Fukushima. The committee 
strongly supported the continuation of our involvement in this agreement, uh, which does ensure that the peaceful use of nuclear science and technology is advanced throughout the region. The committee did note that there could have been opportunity uh, to upgrade the agreement rather than as such simply rolling it over, and the report does suggest that Australia uh, could and should look in future at taking the opportunity to strengthen the safety and non-proliferation aspects of this agreement, uh, especially in light of the Fukushima disaster. Given the agreement is renewed every five years, this is an item we would expect to be taken into account at that time. In relation to report number 128, which contains the committee's views on the Treaty's Ratification Bill 2012, I inform the Senate that the committee has recommended that this bill not proceed. The bill was introduced by the member for Kennedy into the House of Representatives in February of this year to address what he perceives as the undemocratic nature of treaty negotiation and implementation. The member for Kennedy was concerned that the treaties Australia is entering into are economically damaging to Australian agriculture and manufacturing and claimed that Australia's sovereignty is being eroded. Members of the committee do not necessarily agree with the member for Kennedy's uh, summation there. The way in which trade treaties are negotiated continues in times to be a matter of controversy, but equally I especially and the committee overall recognised the absolutely vital importance of free trade to Australia uh, and the continued negotiation, the continued negotiation by the Australian government uh, of bilateral and multilateral free trade agreements and participation in those fora. There may be a popular perception in some places that Australia is being disadvantaged by these agreements. However, open markets to foreign products, services and investment is absolutely essential Order. to Australia's future, and I welcome and I welcome Senator Wong's enthusiastic support for the findings of the committee. Order. I welcome Senator Order, Wong's enthusiastic Order. support. I would, uh, I would suggest, Mr Deputy President, to Senator Wong that uh, uh, take a look at some of the comments of the likes of the member for Hindmarsh as well on some of these topics. You might find that uh, they are not in accordance with some of the strong views of the Minister for Trade or others either. Order, Senator Wong. The Order. Mr Deputy President. Order. The Treaties Committee considered these issues during its study of the Australia-Chile Free Trade Agreement in 2008. At the time, the committee recommended that there could be more thorough cost-benefit assessment of treaties provided by the government to ensure that there is a better understanding of the benefits that stem from these types of free trade agreements. The committee has reiterated this in this report in a broader sense, given that it covers more than just trade, trade agreements and recommended that prior to commencing negotiations for any new agreements, the government table in parliament a document setting out its priorities and objectives, including the anticipated costs and benefits of the agreement. This, we think, would provide greater transparency to the treaty-making process and allow the Treaties Committee to have the opportunity to engage with the government of the day on the treaty-making process before such treaty negotiations are finalised, which is an important point across all aspects of treaty making. However, as I indicated, the member for Kennedy's bill is not, in the opinion of the committee, the solution to the concerns that it has indicated or to the concerns that the committee may have about the lack of parliamentary involvement in the treaty making process at its earlier stages. We see that the bill has a number of flaws and would be unworkable. The bill itself has only one substantive provision, and that is that the Governor-General must not ratify a treaty unless both houses of the Parliament have, by resolution, approved the ratification. The committee received a number of excellent submissions and heard evidence from well-informed witnesses at the public inquiry that was held into the bill. And from this evidence, the committee concluded that it appears the bill is likely to be constitutional. Section 61 of the Constitution places formal responsibility of treaty making with the executive rather than the parliament. The wording of the bill indicates that the parliament is not taking over the ratification function, however, but rather makes the executive's decision to ratify conditional upon the parliament's prior approval. However, the bill would present a number of practical and political problems to both the parliament and the executive if passed as presented. The sheer number of treaties, many of them dealing with administrative matters, 
along with, indeed, uh, the nature of the parliament at times has the potential to overwhelm the parliamentary process if all treaties were subject uh, to this arrangement. The bill's lack of a provision, particularly for short-term emergency treaties, would make the bill unworkable. For example, the Joint Standing Com Committee on Treaties has reviewed, on behalf of the parliament, over 600 treaty actions at an average of almost 40 treaties per year since it was established in 1996. If both powers of the parliament had to, by resolution, approve the ratification of each treaty as the bill demands, the parliament would certainly uh, need to be here more often and have little time, perhaps, to complete its other business. Although other models exist overseas which may add a greater degree of parliamentary scrutiny to the treaties review process, the bill is a very brief document which allows little room for amendment without a comprehensive change of its intent. That is why the committee has made the recommendation that I highlighted earlier to give greater parliamentary oversight and involvement at an earlier stage of the negotiating process, which we believe would be a good step on the reforms the Howard government instigated in establishing the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties originally. Mr President, I thank the Committee Secretariat for its work, as always, on both of these reports, and I commend both of the reports to the Senate. The question, Senator Ludlam. Um, thanks, Deputy President. On the same matter, I'd just like to follow up uh, on some of Senator Birmingham's comments from the point of view of the Australian Greens, and I'll focus mostly on uh, the fifth agreement to extend the 1987 regional cooperative, a cooperative agreement for research, development and training related to nuclear science and technology. So this was signed up to by Australia on the 15th of April 2011. Um, Senator Birmingham um, pulled out one of the quotes and I just wanted to highlight it. I think it was extremely interesting that that was one that he, that he chose to highlight. Um, and I've got a great regard for Senator Birmingham and also for the work of the Treaties Committee and its Secretariat. This is one of the this is, this is a, a diligent committee that performs an extraordinarily important role. Given that um, so much of, of treaty making between Australia and other countries overseas is done by the executive and the parliament gets to find out about it after it's done, the role of the treaties committee, and at the very least assessing and providing recommendations to the government and to the parliament before they're rubber stamped, if indeed they are, is tremendously important. And this is an opportunity missed. The Treaties Committee has done, in recent times, um, extremely important work, for example, on the agreement uh, on the proposal to sell uranium to Russia, which is presently uh, assisting Iran in uh, creating a domestic nuclear power capacity and potentially other things. And so for the committee to note that, and I'll quote, there may have been an opportunity missed to upgrade the agreement rather than simply rolling it over. But then, of course, that's precisely what the committee enables and facilitates. We give it the rubber stamp and we say, yes, this should simply be rolled over for another couple of years and miss an enormous opportunity to assess what just happened in this industry, what just happened in the nuclear industry. One of the things that I um, hope to speak about in a bit more detail uh, sometime later in this session uh, is the visit that I was very fortunate to take over the break to Tokyo and Fukushima uh, and spent some days in the areas surrounding the destroyed reactor complex uh, that was wrecked after the earthquake and then tsunami last March 11. That then depopulated a large stretch, not just of Fukushima Prefecture, but areas uh, a long way away uh, to the north and the west of the reactor plant, and that actually had the Prime Minister of Japan uh, briefed by officials on the evacuation of Tokyo, which has a population of roughly 30 million people that if TEPCO had walked away from that reactor complex and they had gone into full meltdown uh, and had lost all four of the plants plus the spent fuel ponds, they would have had to evacuate the northern half of Japan, including Greater Tokyo, from one accident at one power station. So it's remarkable then to return from that trip, which I will speak of at greater length when I have the opportunity, uh, to see the tabling of this document that says, no, nah, this is fine, she's, she's right. Uh, we can just carry this on, roll it over. Everything has changed, colleagues, in this particular industry. In fact, everything changed after Chernobyl. The industry simply went into a flat line, and very, very few countries, apart from China, and let's not dismiss their um, extremely ambitious nuclear build, and this is a country that does what it says it's going to do in this kind of area, and apart from that, all of the news is, uh, is negative for the nuclear sector. All of the indicators are backwards. 
Since the disaster, three countries, Germany, Belgium and Switzerland, have announced a nuclear phase-out. Only two units are currently online in Japan. And the move and the mood in the country at the moment uh, is strongly against the restarts. So Japan is now scrambling for alternate sources uh, of supply, including gas from Australia, and they are on a quite an aggressive energy efficiency mechanism. And people in Japan are saying, you sold us out and betrayed us twice. Firstly, you told us that these plants were safe and that this could never happen. And secondly, you told us that these plants were essential and that we needed them all. Neither of those things is true. And trust on behalf of the Japanese people in the government that led them into this extraordinary disaster uh, is over. Patience has snapped, snapped and the situation has turned. For the Australian government then to document its total ignorance of that fact uh, I think is, is something more than an opportunity missed. It's having consequences in the industry. So maybe this reality hasn't yet washed through the parliament where this kind of strange pro-nuclear delusion that everything's great and will continue to be great still prevails. In industry, the mood has changed as well. BHP Billiton appears to have put off its decision about the expansion of the Olympic Dam project for two years. Obviously, that's a big copper venture as well. It would also be the world's largest uranium mine and the world's largest excavation hole in the ground if it goes ahead. They've, they've parked it for the time being. The proponents of the Kintai uranium mine in the western desert of WA, Cameco and Mitsubishi, not niche players, the largest uranium miner in the world and one of the largest uh, industrial combines in the world, have backed away from Kintai. BHP has also backed away from the Illyri project in Western Australia. Toro, uh, who really are a, a two-bit player, have this nasty little project uh, in the Lake Way Basin, not too far from Waluna in Western Australia. They haven't told the market yet, but they're going to need to back away from that project as well because it is utterly sub-economic. One of the reasons it's sub-economic is that the world uranium price won't be recovering because customer countries don't want what we're selling anymore. And yes, it will take time to back out of some of the disastrous investment decisions that have been made worldwide, not just in Japan, but in all the countries that took up this technology. And thank goodness we never took the bait here in Australia. But the, the market for this poisonous product that we insist on selling is disappearing fast. It would have been nice to have seen some recognition of that fact in here. TEPCO has lost. This is the utility that operated the Fukushima plant. Its balance sheet has been annihilated. It is worth much less than nothing. It is now a colossal, uncapped, unknown liability on the taxpayers of Japan. It's lost 90 per cent of its share value since 2007. French state utility, where there haven't been any catastrophic accidents in the last year or two that we know of, lost 82 per cent of its value. The share price of the French state company Arriva, which we're in the process of kicking out of Kakadu, which is superb news, and I applaud the government for that, has fallen by 88 per cent. Siemens, the big German uh, industrial group, has announced it will entirely withdraw from the nuclear industry because it frees up funds that Siemens can redeploy in businesses with better visibility. What better visibility could you ask for than an industrial accident that depopulates a region, destroys the fishing industry, destroys agriculture and horticulture, forces the evacuation of 150,000 people, and laces an entire region with iodine and radiocesium? the kind of visibility that Siemens has decided it can do without. In Fukushima, and I will speak at this in greater length, 36 per cent of the children screened have found to have, had, uh, have abnormal growth cysts or nodules on the thyroids. So iodine, radioiodine, uh, has quite a short half-life. It's an aggressive isotope, and the body reads it as normal iodine and parks it in the thyroid gland. 36 per cent of kids in this area. This is post-evacuation. This is kids still left behind in the contaminated zone. This is a trade that Australia can do without. This is a trade Australia can do without. They can certainly do without it in Tohoku and in the regions that were showered with radiocesium originating in Kakadu and central South Australia. The Australian Prime Minister says when she was asked, and this statement was some time ago, so perhaps she would consider re, uh, rethinking this one, but she put on the record that Fukushima doesn't have any impact on my thinking about uranium exports. You know, it's had an impact on thinking in Japan, one of our biggest customer countries. It's had an impact in Germany. It actually has had an impact in China, where they have put some of their proposed reactor build on ice and they've backed away from the really aggressive expansion plans. They are still building these plants. I won't pretend that they won't uh, build and complete some of them. But the idea that it doesn't have any impact on my thinking about uranium exports, I find just baffling. 
Um, Prime Minister Gillard uh, paid the Japanese Prime Minister of the time the honour and the courtesy of visiting some of the areas shattered by the tsunami, uh, as I was able to um, eight, uh, 16 or 17 months on. So she's seen the destruction. She knows of the areas that have been evacuated. But I would invite her to spend just a couple of days in and around the contaminated area where the farmers are now being told that their food is poisonous, where the fishing industry has collapsed. And there's nobody here from the National Party, but you know, for people representing agricultural communities, farming communities, um, and all of us in this chamber, to be told as a farmer that the food you produce will give you cancer is shattering. This is a report, I think. You read the J. Scott report, and there is simply no reflection. There's blissful ignorance, just imagining that this hasn't happened. Industry is starting to wake up. The Japanese people and the peoples of other countries, client countries, of this toxic and unnecessary and obsolete trade are waking up. I call on the Australian government. Take another look at this one. This is an industry that we can do without. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it.